Hello, and welcome to Beginning Engineers. Today, I'm going to be talking about ISO. What is ISO? ISO is the International Organization for Standardization. ISO is an international standard setting body composed of representatives from different national standards organizations. So that means it's comprised of a bunch of different standards organizations coming together. The modern version of ISO as we know it was founded in 1947. Although in some countries, like the United States, it didn't become popular until the late 1990s, early 2000s. It's headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, and works in roughly 200 countries. It's important to point out that ISO is an independent, non-government organization. It is the world's largest developer of voluntary standards to facilitate trade between nations of the world. So it's important to notice, too, that these are voluntary standards. Most companies opt into these. Now, there are many situations where to be a supplier of a certain company, you have to be ISO certified. But in general, these are voluntary standards. No one comes to you at gunpoint and says, get ISO certified. So what exactly are the benefits of ISO? Why become ISO certified? Well, if you follow ISO standards, ISO helps increase product quality and protect the consumer especially depending on which ISO standard you're following. ISO facilitates global standards to help companies enter new markets. If you can become ISO certified, you can sell to hundreds of countries that also have those standards in place. The three official languages of ISO are English, French, and Russian. In terms of structure, there is a head council with 20 rotating members and a central secretariat who coordinates with the organization. So it's not just a group of people that have been in power forever. They are rotating members. But who actually develops the ISO standards? Well, there are 250 technical committees who help develop them. Does ISO cost anything? And how does membership work? Well, there are 162 national members. So countries that have a national level of membership. But there are different types of membership as well. You have member bodies, so these are national bodies that have voting rights. It will be the standards organization for that country. They are the ones involved. In the United States, we have ANSI. You may have heard of them. Then you have correspondent members. So these are countries that do not have their own standards organization, but they are still informed about ISO's work. But they also do not promote ISO, like the member bodies would. Then you have subscriber members. So these are countries with small gross domestic products that pay a reduced fee, but they still follow the development of the standards. So these are countries with a pretty small economy that maybe don't have enough money or power to really influence global trade, but they're still interested, so they still follow along in the development. Now the funding for ISO can come through companies working on projects that contribute money, subscriptions, so at the national level, and the sales of standards. In recent years, though, there has been some criticism of selling the standards to make money. There are some who argue that if companies or organizations are doing work for the well-being of society, they shouldn't have to purchase these standards. Some people also argue that due to the nature and structure of ISO, it's becoming somewhat of an old boys club where if you really want to see a change, you have to do some sort of lobbying. How do the ISO standards get developed in the first place? Well, here's a general overview. There's way more detail than this, but this is the basic process. You have the preliminary stage, proposal, the preparatory phase, the committee phase, the inquiry phase, approval, and then publication. And I put some of the associated names of the draft and acronyms at that point. There are also two other stages worth noting. Standards can be reviewed or withdrawn. Some stages can be skipped as well. And at every stage, you involve experts and voting to see what moves on and what doesn't. What are some examples of standards that have been published? Researching this, I found a lot more than I realized. I'm sure every couple years, there's more and more standards being published, which is a good thing. Standardization is great. You've probably seen ISO stickers on the back of semi-trucks. Most of those are ISO 9001, which means you have a quality management system in place. There's also ISO 14000, 
environmental management, 45,001, occupational health and safety. So I wonder how similar that is to OSHA rules. There's 27,001, information security, which is becoming ever more important in today's age. There's 26,000, which is social responsibility, which is interesting to me. I wonder if they work with the Benefit Corporation here in America. Some companies are B Corps certified. It's a similar concept. 50,001, energy management, which I wonder if it has any similarities to LEED certifications that many buildings get. There's 3166, which is country codes, so that every country gets its own unique code. 4217, currency codes, so we don't confuse ourselves when talking about exchange rates. There's 639, language codes. There's 22,000, food safety management. Again, in America, we have serve safe, so I wonder how much of an overlap there is. And 31,000, risk management. To me, it will be interesting to see in the coming decades if we abandon a lot of our own national standards and move to more global standards. And there's arguments on either side, depending on which one's better for you personally, which one's better for the country, stricter, etc. There are arguments for and against globalization, but I think in general there's a lot of benefits to be had. I mean, imagine if most of the world followed 22,000, food safety management, for example. You could go to a restaurant or a grocery in almost any country, and as long as you know that country's ISO certified and enforces it, you could feel safe buying some of the food there. And that's just one example. I mean, think about the benefits of all these standards if they were adopted in every country. But also, again, some countries may have their own versions of these standards that are already stricter, so they would lose something by going to the ISO standard. And again, ISO standards are voluntary, so I don't see countries forcing companies to follow these standards anytime soon, unless it's a matter of national security or safety. Thank you so much for watching this beginning engineer's video. I hope you learned a lot about ISO and understand the basic functions and structure of the organization. If you like this video, please subscribe. I'm going to try to do dozens of engineering topic videos in the coming weeks. Have a great day.